Hello, good morning. And I'm glad that I get to talk to you right before lunch because my goal is to get you hungry and excited <laughs> to go down to the cafeteria um, or to jot down some new ideas for things you might want to try. Um, okay, so here's some contact info for me. Um, if you want to reach out afterwards, if you have a question or something you, know, you thought of that you want to share, um, feel free to reach out. Um, you can, if you can't see this, you can probably find my info on the internet if you look for it. Uh, feel free to email me. Um, I do have a, an author website with a, a blog that is mostly defunct ever since I really got on Facebook, so, which is very time wasting and also very awesome. So um, if you are on Facebook I would in, and you like this topic, I would encourage you to join the um, Chinese Kitchen Garden Facebook group. I say group because that's an easier way to interact. Um, so feel free to join that, post things, answer questions, ask questions, that kind of thing. Um, and then I do have um, an old family garden blog which is very defunct, um, but there's a lot of information there about growing and cooking Chinese vegetables. All that stuff happened before the book, so there is some good info there if you wanted to look there as well. Okay, I am going to just talk about the book for a moment because I actually, not just because I wrote it, but I do think that it's an awesome so source of information. I'm, I'm actually going to pass it around. And Amazon has actually kind of messed me up a little bit. The retail price is $20. Amazon's selling it for $5. I will sell it to you for $10, which is my price, if you're interested. I'm just pushing this for a moment, and then I promise I will stop. But um, I think it's great because um, I would describe it as like a third memoir, a third how to grow these vegetables, and a, and a third how to use these vegetables. And I try to give information about how to use these vegetables the way we use them in my family, and also how you might use them in your recipes. Um, so I do think that it's very useful. People have said that it's been a good guide to go to the Asian supermarket and kind of figure out what things are and how to use them. Um, I also have like over 20 recipes. So um, feel free to take a look. Also, the photographer for this book, um, I'm realizing I'm near Queenstown, right? She just recently moved here a couple years ago. So, so um, know that the photographer is one of your own. She is amazing. She actually does um, wedding photography. Um, so if you want, if you need like amazing photography, she doesn't just do food. Food was a special project for her, um, but she's a, a really amazing um, family photographer. Okay. Um, so yeah, so my goal is to show you a bunch of different vegetables and I've chosen a, a wide selection of things to show you. Um, actually, I'm curious about who our vegetable growers are. Can you raise your hand just so I can see who the vegetable growers are? Okay, so it, it really is most of you, I think. Um, yeah, okay, perfect. So in this series of slides, like I said, there's a wide variety, and I do not encourage you to plant bamboo. <laughs> um, but. But bamboo is actually a very interesting vegetable, so I just wanted to share some information with you. Um, obviously, there is um, a running bamboo, and that's why we're not trying to plant bamboo. So don't, please don't tell anyone that you had this Chinese woman encouraging you to plant bamboo. Um, this is a, a stand of bamboo that my dad did plant, but he, he has eight acres and a lot of time and a lot of passion. So he can manage this, and he, and he does it, it does require a lot of work just to manage this clump of bamboo. Um, but with this clump of bamboo, you'll see all of his, I, I actually have a picture of um, a trellis that he's made. So he, 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 uses, um, he uses all the poles. He um, has a chipper and he mulches the bamboo and he uses that mulch in his um, perennial gardens. Um, he's also experimented with making his own broom. Um, he can afford a broom, but he just decided to try to make a broom out of bamboo, which is really cool. Um, and he's made, like, he's made little spoons um, just for fun. Um, so he, so it's, it's, very, it's very useful for him in the garden. And it's edible, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, but one thing that I think is probably the most um, interesting tidbit of information, like, in all of gardening, I think, is the 
the mass flowering of bamboo. Do you know about this thing? Oh, okay. So apparently there's a really good um, PBS um, documentary called Rat Attack. And I tried to find clips on the internet. I've tr every time I do a talk, I try to find clips, but there's nothing. I think you have to buy it. So if you're interested, there apparently is a really good movie called Rat Attack. But bamboo will mass flower every about 50 to 80 years. And, and when this happens, it's, it's, like a, it's like a signal goes off and all the bamboo of a variety, um, which could be everything in a forest, will suddenly um, f um, flower, fruit, and drop all its fruit. So if you can like transport yourself to like maybe Southeast Asia where there might be a lot of bamboo growing, um, which is a very useful, sustainable resource. I mean, they might use bamboo to construct furniture, um, parts of their homes, um, to sell, um, to eat. And suddenly it all mass flowers, fruits, which is okay, I mean, you think it's okay. And then the fruit drops Okay, so you can kind of imagine what a crab apple tree will do um, when all that fruit drops. It's kind of gross and mushy and um, will eventually attract rodents to this Southeast Asian area that I'm asking you to imagine. Um, with all the rodents, um, we have diseases and uh, people get sick and then suddenly all the bamboo dies. So it's, it's crazy. And so when that happens, it's, you know, without like a proper explanation, which I think there are actually several theories, but I don't, I'm not sure if there's a definitive answer um, besides just sort of an internal clock going off. Um, it's it's a, a very bad omen when this happens. And actually my dad was saying that when the, um, the onset of communism really affected his village in um, Sandong, um, this happened. So, you know, who, who knows if you can really link the two, but um, it's what people have, have, uh, I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting thought. Right, right. And I think part of that depends on the variety of bamboo, too. But that's definitely an interesting thought. OK, so transport yourselves back to America, um, where we don't have to worry about those things as much, um, partially because we have Orkin. I mean, honestly, we, we do have ways of dealing with these kinds of things. But if in, in countries that are, um, um, have fewer resources, it is difficult to deal with. Anyway, has anyone had fresh bamboo? I don't mean like, you know, bamboo in your stir fry at the local Chinese takeout. Okay, okay. Fresh bamboo is actually really, really amazing. It tastes nothing like the, um, it tastes nothing like what you get from your Chinese restaurant. The Chinese restaurant is using bamboo that's in a big tin can. Um, honestly, a lot of times it's already gone bad. Um, I have had, I have had, you know, certain dishes, and I'm like, what is that taste? And turns out it's the bamboo. It's always the bamboo. It's the bamboo that's turned. Fresh bamboo, um, like you see in this little sort of diagonal piece, um, is really crisp and sweet, and um, has kind of a fresh spring taste. Um, and this is what it looks like coming out of the ground. So this is from my dad's big stand of bamboo. This might be like eight inches tall. Um, and what you, what you do to harvest it, and, and what I would encourage you to do is maybe try foraging for bamboo. So if you know of a bamboo stand that is not being sprayed, so like roadside bamboo, Please also don't go on the highway and <laughs> be trying to harvest bamboo. Number one is not safe. Number two, it could be sprayed with something. So I'm talking about like a, a natural stand somewhere. Um, 
All you need to do is literally kick it down. So just kick it at the base. And I actually, I did a video a couple years ago. I'm wearing flip flops and I'm just kick, you, you just kick it and it breaks really, um, really easily. Like if you grow asparagus, you know when that asparagus is growing out of the ground, it doesn't take much to just snap it right off. So bamboo will snap right off like that. Um, you cut it diagonally and you can take your thumbs right at the tip and just scoop that heart right out. And that's the part that you eat. Okay, and you do need to um, you do need to boil the bamboo before you eat it. Um, there are like um, it's allergenic. You know, my mom and I actually both tested it um, just to see what would happen. And actually, we tested it on Mother's Day, and I was like, oh my god, if I kill my mom on Mother's Day, it's gonna be really bad. Um, but we, we kind of tested it, so I, I chewed on a little piece without boiling it and spit it out, and my, my tongue felt kind of tingly, like when you eat too much pineapple, and you get that kind of tingle in your mouth. Does that happen to some of you? And my mom actually swallowed it, and she said that her throat was, kind of, was feeling kind of weird. Um, but we tested it because I've had people say, oh, I never boil bamboo, and I just eat it, and I'm fine. So we just kind of wanted to see what would happen. Um, but all you need to do is just boil it for like half an hour with the lid off, dump the water, and you're totally good. And the best thing about bamboo is that these little, cran these little nooks and crannies, they hold all the sauce of whatever you're cooking in that bamboo. Um, actually, there's a recipe in here for um, bamboo and pork belly cooked in a, in a sweet soy sauce, and that is just amazing. Yeah? What time? And is there a height at which they have become too big? Yeah, yes. Um, soon. I, was, I would say probably, with, probably with, within the next few weeks. And it's a very short, um, it's a very short season. So, so um, they'll look like this. This is just like your typical running bamboo, you'll see. It's not like a special variety. Um, there, there are hundreds of different types of bamboo, and they're all edible. Some, are, some taste better than others. But this is just like a common kind of running bamboo. Um, and after, it's sort of, sort of similar to asparagus, when you see them get really tall and they just kind of go kind of crazy, um, it'll, it'll be too late. The harvest period is like maybe two weeks or so. It's pretty short. OK, so snow pea shoots. Anyone try snow pea shoots? OK, a lot of times you can find this in, um, you know, salad mixes, or you can find a container of snow pea shoots in certain stores. Um, and it's literally the top maybe eight to 10 inches of snow pea plants. Um, it's a really tender green. This is one you could, you could eat raw. Um, and, and you can see in the picture, this is not my picture, but you can see in the picture that um, the, the little tendrils the, um, I don't know if there are any flowers in there, but the flowers are edible, the stems are pretty um, tender, um, and it, it's a great green. It's a great green for sauteing, too. And in Chinese cuisine, we, we saute almost, every, we, we, we cook almost all the greens. But this is a really great one to eat raw. Um, what I like to do with this is, um, I, if I'm seeding a row of snow pea plants, I'll just you know, dump a pile into my hand, and I'll do, you know, every six inches or whatever, I'll put, put a seed down. And whatever I have left in my hand, I'll just put them in a mound, in a little circle. And that will be, that will be my designated um, greens mound. So these, and you, what you, you could snip the top few inches and hopefully still get some uh, snow peas. Um, you could always try that. But I like to keep that little mound just for snow pea shoots. And if you haven't started your snow peas, then you can do that this weekend or today. <coughs> um, snow pea shoots are really um, mild and delicate. So this is not something I would dump a whole bunch of sauce on. I would probably just stir fry it really lightly like this, maybe with some garlic. Let's eat it as a side dish. Chrysanthemum greens are, greens are really interesting. And actually, I'm going to pass around this little bag. In this little bag, it looks a little suspect, but they're actually chrysanthemum flowers. Um, the, if you have, has, have you had chrysanthemum tea? 
Okay, chrysanthemum tea is such a delicious, fragrant tea. And um, these flowers are used to make the tea, and it's a different, um, it's a different type of plant than the ones that make the greens that we eat. But the fragrance is kind of the same. You'll, you'll see that it's, it has a very fragrant smell. To me, it smells sweet, too. But I think that's because I, I associate chrysanthemum tea with sugar. I like to put sugar in my chrysanthemum tea. But um, I'm passing it around because it has this, a similar kind of fragrance. It's really interesting. It doesn't take a lot of time to cook. So this is also another, one that you would just very lightly stir fry or perhaps cut up and add um, to soup. Um, I just made these beans the other day. Both of my kids are vegetarian, so we're trying to get with the program. Um, so we, so I, made some, I just made some white beans the other day. Um, and, and I cut up some arugula and mixed it in. Um, and arugula wilts really quickly, you know, and I feel like this would be a really good um, alternate for that. So just lightly chop it up and mix it, mix it in at the end. Has anyone had a hot pot dinner, like a Chinese hot pot dinner, or you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so a hot pot is like, uh, imagine, if, imagine like a fondue. Okay, you're sitting with your family, it's festive, it's nice, you're cooking your own food, there's a big pot in the middle, but instead of cheese, you're, it's, it's like a, a pot of broth. So you would cook you know, your m maybe meat, seafood, tofu, whatever. Um, at the end, you can imagine that soup that you've been cooking the, the stuff in is really fragrant. Um, and you could end with a little bowl of soup. And before you do that, you might add some greens just to, so they're wilted. Um, and then have your little bowl of soup. And that's how um, chrysanthemum greens are used traditionally as well, like in a hot pot. So if you were to make some chicken soup, you could just add some in your bowl, pour your soup on top just so it's wilted, and it would just add a little something. Um, if you're gonna try growing this, so at this stage, the leaves have probably become bitter. So it's kinda nice, you, got, you get your greens in the early spring, and then you've got your flowers, and then they can go, and you can do something else in your garden spot in the fall. <laughs> they're not the they're not the same mums you have. They're not the same ornamental mums that you bought last August. Um, if you were to buy these, you would look for garland chrysanthemum, or or it would be designated edible chrys chrysanthemum greens, or something like that. Like yeah. It's not so much on the mic, but your, your recording your hairs. Um, make it oh, okay. Is that okay? Yeah. I that. usually wear my hair up too. <laughs> the one time I wear my hair down. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so those are chrysanthemum greens. Oh, Malabar spinach is a great one. Is anyone growing Malabar spinach? Okay, okay. Malabar spinach is great. And these are two plants grown, that are growing in pots. Um, so you see one on the right, and you see one on the left. The one, the, this, these belong to my friend, um, to my friend Grace, who is, is not, who, who is not Asian. Um, and she's been growing it for years. The one on the right is about two or three years old. So she'll grow her Malabar spinach in a pot. It's a perennial vining spinach. And she'll take it in um, before it gets too cold. Sh and she'll just clip leaves off of it. You know, she's just cooking for herself. So she'll, cook, she'll clip leaves off of it. And what she'll usually do is just chop it up a little bit and put it in a bowl. And she'll ladle her soup on top. And that's how she usually does it. Um, my dad, okay, so, so the one on the right is about two or three years old. The one on the left is uh, probably just a, a couple months old, well, maybe like three months old. So you can see the one on the right, the leaves have gotten a little smaller, um, but they're, you know, they're both still good. The first time my daughter tried this at Grace's house. Um, my, my older daughter is very, very agreeable. She's very sweet. She'll just, she'll, you know. So Grace was like, oh, here, try this. And so my daughter put a leaf in her mouth and she started chewing it. And then she told me later that um, she almost spit it out because it, it was foaming in her mouth. Um, I was like, foaming in your mouth? 
I, I did not know that this would foam in your mouth because um, my parents will usually stir fry it. Um, or if Grace is putting it in her soup, she would also not know. But it's kind of mucilaginous, like it has a mucilaginous quality, which is nice because it can be like a thickening. Um, it can kind of thicken your soup ever so slightly. Um, but I'm saying this because I, I don't know if it would be a great salad green. Do you ladies who grow it eat it raw or cook it? You usually cook it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think this one is usually best um, cooked. Um, some people complain that they drop a lot of seeds. I haven't really had that problem. Um, and then the, when they do reseed, you just pull them out pretty easily. Um, but I will warn you that some people have complained that it's, um, it can be kind of annoying. Or when they make their little berries and seeds, you can just clip them off or pinch them off. That's what some people do. This is a great green to grow um, through the summer because when your Fort Hook spinaches and your lettuce, when those have all bolted, um, this is still going strong in the garden. So these are daylily buds, another edible flower. So if you're interested in edible flowers, daylilies are great. I don't advocate for um, harvesting from your neighbor's perennial garden. <laughs> but if you wanted to, you could. And they'd be really delicious. Um, this is a stir fry my mom made with just the daylily buds that were picked um, the morning before they open. So they're still kind of nice and tight. You can just squeeze them open, check for bugs, pull out the pollen-covered anthers, and just kind of give them a very, very quick rinse, and they're ready to go. Um, it, it, she, these were probably stir-fried at the, OK, so she, she cooked the chicken. You'll see cilantro in there. I thought she, she makes this with celery, but I don't see celery in it. Um, and then the, the buds, the flower buds, were added probably in the last maybe two or three minutes. Um, just so that they're a little softer. And if, if you've had like squash blossoms or other edible flowers, you know that um, edible flowers have kind of a sweet taste. Um, they kind of have like a, almost a squeaky mouth feel. Do you know what I mean? Like when you chew into them. Um, but they're very delicious. Um, my dad actually had a very, very large um, area of, of daylilies just for eating daylily buds. So what they will do is they will either um, dehydrate them, in which case you can just rehydrate them a little bit before you need to use them, or, um, or they'll freeze them. OK, so this, this is bitter melon. And actually, if you look at the picture, you can see all the bamboo up top. So this is a bamboo from my dad's garden. And, and um, you know, it's, it's just one way that he uses all that bamboo. But bitter melon is really interesting. Who's had bitter melon before? OK, bitter melon is, do you like it? Do you, people raise your hand. <laughs> yes, it is a yes. And no. I have to figure out how to cook it properly. OK, all right. OK, so um, bitter melon is, is truly bitter. So first, you have to expect that. OK, but then, um, as I mentioned in my book, think about all the other bitter tastes that you're used to that you might enjoy. You know, like, the, like a dark chocolate, or a vodka, or um, even the arugula. If you're, if, you're, if you're adding arugula, you're looking for that bitter taste. OK, so, so first keep in mind that it is, it is definitely bitter. It's supposed to be bitter. Um, and and you're, you're looking for that taste. Um, what some people can do is, um, and this, this is a bitter melon. What some people can do is, what some people, some people like to do is to salt it first. And if you salt it, it removes a little bit of the bitterness. Um, I don't, I don't really, most people I know um, who grew up with bitter melon don't do that. Um, but since it is strong, it goes well with strong tastes, like, um, like a black bean sauce or the garlic or spices. That kind of balances out, out a little bit. Um, and another, th another way that's really yummy is to, is to pickle it. So if you make pickles and you have like your favorite sweet pickle recipe or a spicy pickle recipe, like a sweet hot pickle, that would be really good. If you had a sweet hot pickle recipe, you could um, use, use bitter melon. And that would be a really tasty way to, to, to use it. And I'm just going to show you real quick how to um, cut this thing open. 
I feel like the biggest mystery with Asian vegetables is how to use it or like what part to use it. So I feel like um, that's why I feel like my book is pretty useful because it explains all that stuff. But you, you know that it's bitter melon because it has these bumpy ridges all over it. And actually I found, these are from the Asian supermarket. And I found this guy, it, it looks like a hedgehog, doesn't it? <laughs> um, this is an Indian bitter melon. So both are bitter. Some people say this is a little more bitter. Um, but the, the bumps, the little lumps and bumps are a little, are, are smaller and a little more severe. These are a little more rounded out, but the, you know, similar taste and similar use. Actually, a friend of mine whose um, husband is um, Indian said that they would s slice it open. Um, his mom would add like a, stu like a meat filling, tie it up and steam it. And he was saying that when he was young, he used to sneak over to the table, untie it, eat the meat, and tie it back up. And put, you know, so that's what we kids would do to, you know, to accommodate. Actually, I did a similar thing when I was little. I would just pick all the meat out of the dish. But the way my mom would do it is um, she would, you know, she'd cut it in half lengthwise. And you can see um, this the center part is like a, it's, it's soft and pithy and you don't eat that. And there are, these seeds are actually gigantic. If you try to grow these, um, the biggest trick is to get them to germinate. And soaking the seeds, nicking the seeds, filing the seed a little bit may help. Um, other than that, it's just a matter of being patient. So what you would do from here is basically just scoop this stuff out. Um, and, and you make like a little boat. So you could, you could do, you know, you could make, your stuffed squash and just put a filling inside um, and steam it like that. Or you, could, or you could actually cut it into rings and stuff it if you wanted. Or the way my mom usually cooks it is, um, and the way you'll see it in most restaurants, is just cut the way I've cut it and then um, cut into little pieces. And you'll recognize it because you'll see these little C-shaped pieces. That's how you'll usually find it in a restaurant. Another way you could do it is just to cleave off the outside. And um, that's kind of an easy way to do it. And then you would just eat these little pieces. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I would say if you're going to. Do they have vegetables? Do they sell vegetables there? So the good news is that you can always grow the stuff yourself. I mean, a, a pack of seeds is going to cost you a dollar fifty or something. So if you see something interesting and your store doesn't sell it, you know, you, you really can't lose by just trying something out. So. Um, and I do have a list of seed sources later on if you wanted to, to uh, if you want to try. Every time I buy it, it goes to mush. Well, first of all, when you buy it, um, it's already halfway mush. Like this, I think, looks awful. I, I would never eat this. Um, it's been, I don't even know where it was grown. It was grown somewhere, put on a truck, shipped to my store where people have picked through, and it's just kind of gross. So um, this actually does. This one actually doesn't look so bad. They usually don't look great at the Asian supermarket, and and that's another reason why I would suggest you try them yourself. But to answer your question, um, refrigerator for just a few, you know, for refrigerator for a few days should be fine. I feel like these um, don't do as well because they have so many of these little lumpies that just get knocked over, knocked or bruised or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you would you would just do this. You would take the you would take this mushy part out. And I'm going to tell you something really fascinating about this mushy part. Um, what happened? And I'm going to cut this one open just to see if it's if it's happened. And if it does, it'll be really cool. Okay, no. Um, what happens over time when this thing matures is this mushy part turns into a turns into a bright red goopy thing and and it's actually and it takes and it becomes sweet like my dad grew up in China and he actually grew these um, for the sweet goopy part that happens if I one time I did a talk and I bought one of these and I left it sitting on my counter it was already kind of past its prime and in a couple of days it literally split open 
and the and you could see the red. It has the texture of like a like a roasted red peppers, so it's kind of soft-ish, um, and it is it is literally sweet. So my dad actually grew it as dessert, and he actually didn't know that you um, ate the outside part until he ended up in Hong Kong and had it in a restaurant. So it's pretty interesting. So in nature, um, the, the it will split open. Um, ants will carry off the red stuff, and the seeds will be will remain for you. Is the peel part also bitter? The peel is definitely bitter, and the peel part is what you're eating. So there's nothing that you need to peel from the outside. You're you're eating the outside. Yeah. Okay, these are long beans, and long beans are great also. Long beans are a great one to grow if you haven't grown these yet. Um, I'm going to suggest this to my coworker who has a toddler because long beans grow so fast, and he's like he's really into gardening. He's he's three. He loves gardening. Um, it, it, they're, they're, I remember I remember growing up. I remember my uncle ha growing long beans, and it was really interesting. He had a long row with poles that went up like that, and so the long beans would travel up. It's, it's a pretty big vine. And the long beans grow down in pairs, and they just kind of dangle down. Um, the, the thing about long beans is that they're absolutely not tough. I do not want to say they're tough. Some people, are, some people complain that they're tough. They're not tough. They are, um, the, I, would, I would describe them as sturdy. So they're not, they're not like a great one for eating raw. Like I, I, wouldn't raw, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even just like quickly blanch them and put them in a salad or something. I would cook them. So, and when you cook them, they're amazing. And plus they're super fun because they, they do get really long, as you can see. There are red ones, there are green ones. Um, the flowers are really pretty. Um, they are great stir fried. They're great deep fried. In a lot of Chinese restaurants, um, we, you'll find that they're actually deep fried. Um, very delicious. Uh, the last time I roasted a chicken, I had long beans in my garden, so I cut them into size. You're going to cut them. You're not going to serve people a, a plate with like 10 inch long beans. So you'll cut them into size, um, and then, and I, and I roasted them along with my chicken. And it was perfect. It, it, they didn't fall apart like your tender green beans would. Um, so as long as you think about how you're going to use them and don't expect them to be your tender green you know, beans, um, you, you could en really enjoy them. Did you cut them off? Yeah. Yeah, you'll cut them up. And yeah. Then, um, because they are sturdier, they also freeze really well. So unlike um, unlike your 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 you know average bean, right? If you all of a sudden you wait to make beans, what are you going to do? With them? Well, you blanch some beans and then when you use them, there they're moist. There's these guys, you blanch them just a little bit, you know, to stop the growing process, and then you freeze them. Then when you use them, they're still as good as them. So I really like to grow a lot of these. Yeah, good point. And if you were to um, can them, I would imagine it would be the same. The same benefit is that they don't they don't really fall apart during that process. Yeah. Okay, this is a really interesting one. These are these are luffagourds, and I actually I brought two so you could kind of see the size. Uh, these are both good edible size. Um, Luffa gourds. This is a smooth luffa, like the one on the left, and this is an angled luffa, or sometimes they call it a ridged luffa. And as you can see, by the end of the summer, they if you don't if you miss them, which it'll be easy to miss because they grow so fast, um, they literally will turn into sponges, which you know could be a benefit because I made this little craft a few years ago. Um, what I did with with this is. I, well, first of all, you, you can see the shape here. The, this type is the type you're going to grow if you're growing for sponges. Okay, this is from the supermarket, so people will buy this to eat also. Um, it's kind of, I wouldn't eat this one. It's kind of jacked up looking. It's another, another piece of evidence that it's better to grow your own. If you grow your own, it'll look really nice. But I brought this because you can, 
kind of feel that it's, it's, it's kind of light. It's kind of light and squishy. And you can imagine how by the end of the summer, um, it's much longer, it's wider around, and um, super light. So what I would do by the end of the summer um, before frost is just peel the skin off. The skin may have blackened. Peel the skin off and then um, you'll, you'll see the sponge. So what I do with my little craft is I cut, the, I cut it down like this. I pulled it open, cut, cut away any connecting fibers inside, and I had a sheet of this scrubby stuff. So on the other side of this towel um, is a sheet of the scrubby stuff and then I just sewed it put the little pom-poms in, and um, I gave these as gifts along with like a nice bar of soap. That was a particularly creative year. Um, so um, so this, is the, this is an angled luffa, and this is what we, what we usually eat more. My Taiwanese aunt says that Taiwanese people love this type, but um, we usually eat this. And I'll just show you real quick how to use this. So what we usually do for this is we'll pare just the um, ridges off because the ridges are kind of hard. The ridges are kind of tough. So when you peel just the ridges off, um, it kind of becomes, you know, has like a variegated look to it. You can always recognize it in restaurants because, um, because they'll usually pare these tough ridges off and then they'll usually cut it into little coins. And I'm just going to cut it really thick. I'd probably cut it into more of like a coin, but um, you can see how it has this variegated look. Um, and I would use this like you would use summer squash. For, for me, it's, it's, okay, people love this vegetable. I'm just, for, first, I'm gonna say people love this vegetable. I personally don't love it so much because for me, it's a little bit too soft. Um, so if I were to use it, I don't cook it for, very, for too long, uh, but people love it. And you could, you could really use it any way that you um, use a summer squash. And I would encourage you to do that. I, I wanted to share a little story at the beginning about, um, about this day that my mom made this really delicious green vegetable. And it was the way she usually does it, which is probably just like um, steamed or sauteed with a little bit of garlic. Um, Sometimes she adds this sauce. It's, it's an oyster sauce, but I don't think she did it that day. I think it was just a very light cooking, and, she, and it was delicious, and, and I, couldn't identify, I couldn't identify it. Um, and finally, I was like, what is this? And she said it was romaine lettuce, and I almost spit it out. I was like, oh, because, you know, I'm imagining, what I imagined in my head was that my, ro my Caesar salad had gone very, very bad. It was mushy and warm, and I almost threw up, which is absolutely the wrong way to look at it, because it was delicious. You know, she had made a really delicious dish. So I'm, I'm telling you, don't do that. You know, do don't be stuck in a little box. Um, you know, we might stir fry this, but you might do something, you know, you might do with it what you normally do with your su summer squash. So once you kind of, it's not a, it is a Chinese vegetable. It is a Chinese vegetable, but it does not have to be cooked in a Chinese dish. You see what I'm saying? Like the romaine lettuce is, it is not Caesar salad. Romaine lettuce can be anything you want to do with it. So that's my, my little lecture of the day. Um, this is a really easy one to grow. The vines are really prolific, so it definitely needs something to climb. And um, if you want to try this, I would get your seeds very soon and just put it in the ground and, and see, what you, see what you can come up with. Um, they make so many fruits, and like I said, it's a can't lose situation because if you miss them, you get, they will get tough if, if you uh, go too far past this stage. Um, and actually this, you could even harvest half the size. Um, but if you miss them, they, they turn into sponges, so. Okay, this is, this is my favorite Chinese vegetable, actually. It's Chinese broccoli or gai lan, and um, it's usually cooked just kind of like this picture. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, leafy green. It kind of looks like um, a little bit like broccoli rabe. Um, there, you might see florets, you might, you might see flowers. Um, you'll see leaf, the, the leafy side, you'll see the big fat stems. So if you're cooking it, you want to 
um, kind of separate them and cook the stems for first for a little longer, and then add the leafy the, t the leafy tops, um, like like you would with um, chard or um, or even kale sometimes. And the way we love it is, and the way you'll usually see it in restaurants is um, steamed or boiled and plopped on a plate. Um, and the, the way my mom does it is she'll, she'll, have, um, she'll, she'll heat up oil and she'll throw a ton of garlic, like a ton. Like when you think it's too much, add more. <laughs> that kind of amount. Um, add a ton of garlic and uh, be careful it doesn't burn because you know garlic burns really quickly. Um, and then she'll pour that oil with the garlic over the greens and just um, shake some oyster sauce on top. And this is my favorite brand. If you're looking for oyster sauce, um, this is a very delicious brand. Um, there's also a vegetarian oyster sauce if you're looking for, for something for vegetarians. Yeah, it's um, the Lee Kum Kee brand. It's not cheap. I want to say it's like $7 or so. but. But it, but it also is instant Chinese food. If you're trying to make a Chinese dish with any vegetable, especially leafy greens, my mom will pretty much put this on most leafy greens and it'll just taste really delicious. The, the sauce kind of intermingles with the hot, hot garlic oil and, and even a little moisture from boiling the greens and it's just like a perfect combination. It's very easy and tastes really good. Chinese broccoli is really easy to grow, but what I would suggest with most Chinese greens, Asian greens, is to um, uh, grow them in the fall. Fall is a great time to grow Asian greens. Fall is the best time. Um, you have fewer issues with pests. You have fewer issues with bolting. Um, and a lot of Asian greens are cold hardy. So, and I, actually, I have, a, I have a slide. It might be a little bit later. Oh, no, it's right now. Um, Tatsoi, also known as flat, I don't, really, I don't really hear many people call it flat cabbage or rosette bok choy. Tatsoi is a really great one to start in the fall because it actually sweetens when it's hit with a frost. Just like your carrots sweeten, um, Tatsoi is a great one. Really sturdy, nice leaves. You can see there's probably no insect damage here at all. Um, and this is grown in the fall. This is a great one to grow in a cold frame, too, if you have a cold frame. Um, when it's hit with a frost, the leaves kind of hover to the ground. So when you, when you use them, you can either snip the leaves or sn snip the whole rosette and just kind of rinse it well, because it does grow really low to the ground. But this is a really nice one. Okay. Terra root is really interesting. And I put terra root in here because um, you know, you're, it's going to be hard to grow. This is more of a tropical plant. This is this. It, I mean, if, if you're good with starting things inside or bring you know bringing them out for the summer and back in, um, then you could experiment with it. But it's going to be hard for us to grow. I shared it because I'm finding taro root like everywhere in in um, in in various places. Chinese bakeries will make um, cake out of taro root. Um, if you have a bubble tea store, which I'm not sure if you have, would have a bubble tea store. Yeah. If you get closer to a city, you'll see bubble tea stores everywhere. There are these delicious, sweet drinks. And, and you can get them in many, many flavors. Terra root is a very popular flavor. Um, if you go to the supermarket, you might find, there's a Terra brand. You know those, the black bag of chips um, with various kinds of fried yummy things. They have taro root chips that are very delicious. If you want to try them, you could try that. Um, it's kind of potato-y. It's a starch. So what you're, what you're going to see, you, you might be able to find these in Chinese supermarkets, but the part that you're eating, if you eat those taro root chips, are, um, are, are the insides. So you, you could either steam these and then, you know, um, and eat the insides, or you could peel the, the brown outside and slice them and fry them. Um, and there's, there's not a ton of taste, honestly. It's not a ton of taste. That's why you will see them sweetened and in cakes or bubble tea. Um, coconut is a great flavor to match with taro root, so you might find like a tropical kind of tasting drink. Or you could 
fry it and salt it like a potato chip. It's, it really kind of goes um, both ways. Actually, there's a, there's a restaurant near me that's um, it's called Paladar. It's a, it's a, they call it a, a rum bar. It's a Latin rum bar. But they, they, they serve their guacamole with taro root chips as well. OK, this is winter melon. Winter melon is actually really interesting. And I would say the top part of that winter melon above that, that stem is, um, is the size of a basketball. So it's very large. And there's actually no filter on this either. There, so it, I know it looks kind of like, like there's a cool filter on it, but that's actually a waxy covering that develops on the, win on the winter melon as it matures. And that helps preserve it. This thing, these things can be like 60 pounds because it's, it's like filled with liquid. It's, a, it's, it's almost like a watermelon, how, how juicy it is. Um, and it doesn't have a ton of flavor either. It's supposed to have a lot of health benefits. It's supposed to be cooling for the body. If you go to an Asian supermarket, you might find winter melon in drinks. You might find it um, candied. You might find it in, and, and most of the time, you will find it in soups. So um, if you go to the Asian supermarket, they actually may sell it in big wedges, which would make sense because this would you know, be enough to share with a few of your neighbors. Um, this requires a lot of room to grow if you're going to try to grow it. But I shared it because you might find it in a store or maybe in a, a pretty authentic Chinese restaurant as a, like a winter melon soup. Um, and it would be nice to try. What they might do, like in a banquet restaurant in Hong Kong, if you go to like a really nice restaurant, is you might see this winter melon carved, like in a, a, a bas-relief kind of pattern, like imagine like a dragon or a symbol or something, and it would be hollowed out, the soup would be poured in, the whole thing would be steamed, and as they serve it, they might scoop out a, you know, a ladle of the soup and um, a chunk of the winter melon. Um, this, these flowers are really, doesn't look like it from the picture, but these flowers are not that big. Um, but I, I think you could eat, yeah, I think you could eat them. I haven't really heard that people will eat these winter melon flowers, but they're, I don't, it's, they're not as, the flowers are not as big as it looks in this picture. Yeah. And then a daikon radish, which you may have tried um, in various places. My favorite way to eat daikon radishes are pickled. So um, I think, it, do, who likes pickles? Do you guys like pickles? If you like pickles, pickling vegetables is a great way to try something in a sort of like, you know, step-by-step -step process. Like use your favorite pickle recipe. Um, there are a lot of Vietnamese restaurants where I am and they sell these bun mei sandwiches that are like subs with French bread, maybe like a, like a lemongrass chicken or something. And they might use um, pickled daikon radishes, like kind of chopped up or matchstick. Um, and, and it's very delicious. These are sometimes grown. Um, the white icicle type are grown as tiller radishes. Because as you can imagine, they, as they grow, they really, I mean, they're large. These things are large. Um, they really kind of break up the soil too for you. So some people will grow them in trash cans or like big grow bags um, to have bigger radishes. So a nice one to grow. Um, and, then, and then there's tom yum soup. This is, this is a, an example of a ton of different things you can grow. Cilantro, I have, I have had the best luck growing cilantro by accident. Um, I had asparagus that had flopped over and I suddenly discovered a patch of cilantro I had grown, the only one that survived, because I think they do well in a little bit of shade. So I would suggest a little bit of shade if you like cilantro. Um, they, you see those, those two um, little sticks of lemongrass. And I, I will tell you a little bit about lemongrass. Um, this, to me, smells like fish. And that's because it's from the Asian supermarket. And the vegetables are sold next to the fish, which is awful. I think it's just awful. Um, 
But what I will do sometimes, if I can, if I can find it, and I can find it in more and more stores, is I'll, I'll grow these in, in the, the pot in front of my house where I have my, my thriller, spiller, filler, thank you. And this will be my thriller um, because they'll grow, they'll, you know, they're, they're pretty upright. Um, so they smell really like nothing, but the way you'll use them is to either, well, that was kind of a mistake, you'll, you'll twist them and, and just like cut it into a piece and throw it in your soup. That way you can fish them out before you serve like a bay leaf. Um, and I'll, I'll, well, here, I'll, pass this, I'll pass this around so you can see how, how good it smells. It smells really, actually this one doesn't smell that good. Um, lemongrass smells so, so yummy. I think it smells like lemon pledge and I love lemon <laughs> pledge. Lemon pledge reminds me of my childhood. Um, this is not really strong smelling lemongrass, I don't know why. Um, okay, so another way y you can use that you can use it is to chop it really, really fine. It's kind of grassy and stocky, as you can see. So you don't want your guests to have to chew this. So um, you would chop it up really, really fine. So my mom just got an air fryer, like I'm sure a lot of people have these days, and um, we're so excited about these chicken wings that she makes, where she takes lemongrass and chops it super, super fine so that you don't have to chew it, so that you can just swallow it. And she marinates the chicken wings in this lemongrass. It's, it's very, it's a nice way to use it. Sometimes you'll see it sliced super, super fine. Um, and the section you're gonna use is this bottom section. There's not a lot of fragrance, and this is definitely like, your guests will be like, what are you serving me if you serve them this part? So you're really serving this bottom part. And you're either flavoring the soup and taking it out or um, chopping it really fine. And you can do so much with it. I mean, you can make, you, I, have, I, have a, a, I have an article I clipped from somewhere of lemongrass cocktails. So lemongrass cocktails, lemongrass lemon bars, and then of course something like your Tom Yum soup, which is very fragrant and delicious. Oh, and actually there's a recipe, I have a recipe for this in the, um, there's, a, there's a, a website called Woman's Work which sells garden gloves and all kinds of nice stuff. They have a blog with um, my recipe in it. And if you get the Renee's Garden Seeds newsletter, I believe there's a link to the article that also has this recipe in it, if you're interested. Bird's eye chilies, which are also in this, that spice it up, are really nice chili peppers to grow. So if you like to grow chili peppers, they make a gazillion peppers enough to freeze, enough to dehydrate, enough to crush and add to your pasta um, and your tom yum soup. Um, and they're really hot too. And then finally, um, some seed sources for you. Um, the top two are my favorite, my favorite companies, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds or Renee's Garden Seeds. You'll pretty much find everything you need between those two companies. Um, and then the rest I've just Googled, so you can find other seeds there too. Um, a lot of times Asian supermarkets will have like a pocket thing of seeds. Um, so you could try those too, but, but really anything you, you're looking for, you can probably find from those two. Yeah? On the, on the lemongrass, so when you grow it yourself, you end up with a fairly large clump of grass. Yeah, so one of the, you know, then all of a sudden you have a lot of it also freezes very well, and I, I often just actually, well, I'll do it all actually, you know, I'll take the blades off, and you have to be careful with those because they can be sharp. Um, but even the top part, I'll just cut it with scissors and I freeze it, and then I just throw those pieces in my tea. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's very nice. You can also use it in your iced tea or, you know, whatever. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I think it's, um, it's either Lemon Lift or I Love Lemon. I can't remember which one it is. It's one of the biggie tea brands. But if you look at the ingredients, it's lemongrass. Um, so yeah, that, I'm glad you brought that up. And if you were to take this, for example, and you just, um, OK, so. Yeah, yeah. I think it's that Spice Island brand. Is it Spice Island? It's one of the main spice brands. 
you'll find a jar of literally this de um, dried for like seven dollars. So you can grow it yourself or you can buy th th this whole little thing that I bought was maybe like three dollars at the Asian supermarket. And sometimes if you get like a fresh one, like which this is not, you can root it uh, in a glass of water and then stick that somewhere and plant it. Um, and I put it in, in the planter in front of my house because it, it is not cold hardy, so it will die. So you need to do something with it at the end of the summer if you want. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I would say this one, the bitter melon, has probably gotten the most attention. Um, a lot of studies have been done with bitter melon. Um, it's supposed to be essentially anti-everything, anti-every bad thing, but especially really good for diabetics. Um, so you, you can do the research on your own, but there's a ton of, um, of let's see, evidence, I guess. That, that shows bitter, bitter melon can help reduce blood sugar um, numbers. So people I've met will actually um, make the whole thing into a smoothie. One guy said he drops the whole thing in, including the seeds. And I'm like, oh my god. But he says it's fine, it's good, you know? Um, I don't think I would do that. But yeah, I, I mean, some people will, um, Ju either juice it or make it into a smoothie or if you go to the health food section you will actually see bitter melon uh, extract or whatever in um, in in bottles so a lot everything is nutritious I mean they're you know they're green vegetables green vegetables are always nutritious but some have have been known to be um, very good for you like this bitter melon actually one nutritionist I met said that uh, or one person I met who has diabetes said that her nutritionist wants to know how much bitter melon she's using because she's afraid that it may inter interfere with her medication because it's supposedly it's that powerful. So I'm not making any health claims. Um, if, if you are interested, I would suggest you do your own research or talk to your doctor. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. Hopefully you have gotten some uh, some inspiration and um, and we'll try growing some of these vegetables on your own uh, I think was there one last question yeah You could definitely do either one. Um, if you're doing something like daikon, you could salt it like you would with cucumbers. Um, and you could either make a quick pickle, which I think is delicious, or you could do like a fermented pickle. And you could, um, a lot of people will make kimchi with like Napa cabbage and add the daikons to it, or just make fermented daikons. Uh, and that's a good way to do it. Yeah, yeah.